Hello everybody, trying to find the car that can rightly lay claim to the title of greatest in the world isn't anywhere near as simple as you might think. After all, I'd say if you ask just about anybody, petrol head or otherwise, the answer you're likely going to be given is something somewhat sporty. A Ferrari F40, a McLaren F1, a Lamborghini Countach, perhaps an Aventador if they're a bit younger, or maybe something like a 911 GT3. And these are all fine cars. They give you a thrill. They excite. They are in so many ways a single-minded piece of engineering brilliance. However, if you talk to people who are lucky enough to own machinery like that, what their personal favourite car is, you'll very rarely be told it's one of those. Instead, it's more likely to be something far less glamorous, which has simply done the job faithfully for a number of years. I've known many a person to be far more misty-eyed about their old Beetle or Mini than something like a Lamborghini. But of course, these are all cars with personal significance rather than general greatness. For me, if we are to ignore the fact that cars are all built for different reasons, surely the title of greatest ever has to also go to the world's finest automobile, something luxury orientated, which to me are just as exciting as anything track focused, for a couple of very good reasons. First off, they share the same level of single-minded engineering focus, just with a different goal. Secondly, all of these outlandish and exciting cars like your 911 GT3 RS or Aerial Atoms of the world, while brilliant, are only so in very specific circumstances. Your luxury car is doing its best every single moment you sat in it, and therefore it's a better car more of the time. So then, what's the best luxury car in the entire world? The finest example of a manufacturer doing something without compromise in terms of materials, quality, production or specification. To some, it could be something like a Range Rover, others a Mercedes S-Class, and to many I'm sure, something like a Rolls-Royce has surely got to be the best luxury car in the world ever. I believe for the last 55 years there is a possibility that the Japanese have been quietly creating the finest luxury car in the world and just not telling the rest of us about it. That's what I'm driving today. This is the mighty, the magnificent and the rather marvellous Toyota Century. On the hunt for a used car, it doesn't need to be as quirky as a Toyota Century to be worthy of a car vertical report. Car Vertical works on both desktop and mobile. In just 60 seconds, and for the price of a pair of those weird sunglasses you see at petrol stations, you'll be given a clear and easy to read report detailing a car's accident history, mileage issues, MOT failures, theft or outstanding finance. All stuff you definitely want to know about before you've put your money down. For a special discount on this service, please follow my link in the description down below. The Century really is a genuinely rare thing, not just in overall numbers, but concept too. This is a car designed to be a flagship for an entire company comprising many different brands, but is also aimed at one very specific need. In this case, it's to ferry the very important people of Japan about their business. And every single element of this car has been carefully thought through, designed and executed in a way that makes sure it meets those needs. So in one package, what we really have here is not just the ultimate luxury car, but also the ultimate Japanese car. It is relentlessly Toyota in every single way. And I love it. Where do we even begin? How do you describe a car like this to someone? Well, let's start with the bit that's going to appeal to gearheads the most, the engine. What we have here is, as far as I'm aware, the one and only Japanese production car ever to receive a V12 engine. Codenamed the 1GZFE, this is a 48 valve, 5 litre, naturally aspirated item with quad camshafts and a 10.5 to 1 compression ratio. So then, how much power does it produce? This being a top flight car, 600 horses? No. 500? Also no. 400? Keep going. This, in line with the Japanese gentleman's agreement of the time, makes a claimed 276 horsepower, 280 PS. Torque is a little healthier, 340 pound-feet, that's 460 newton meters. Export models did make a touch more power, though only about 20 horses or so. I don't think this is another case of the Japanese being typically modest. I think those power numbers are probably somewhat accurate. The reasoning for choosing a V12 was instead simple. It is luxurious, 
This is a silky smooth power plant, easily one of the most refined engines I have ever experienced. In fact, as I was doing the drive-bys earlier, a Tesla came past and was deafening by comparison. The gearbox option for these was always an automatic, in earlier examples a 4-speed, but post-2005, like this, a much more modern 6-speed. Unlike a Rolls-Royce, you can actually change gear yourself, and I may experiment with that a little bit later, but I might not, because that would be somewhat uncouth. The first generation Century was introduced in 1967 to honour what would have been the centenary of Toyota's founder. It was only replaced with this, the second generation car, 30 years later, in 1997. This model itself lasted until 2017, when it was then replaced with the third generation car. Interestingly, this, the second generation, stands out, as it was the only one to receive a V12 power plant. Either side of that, you had a V8. The styling is also conservative, as you often find in many a top flight car. So despite the fact this was really all new, it does bear a striking resemblance to the first one. Generally speaking, Toyota have never really had that much interest in exporting the Century. For that reason, very little in here is in English. Even many a Japanese domestic market car is somewhat bilingual. This, really not. In fact, the only things I can see which are in English are the word Century and some of the script for the stereo. That's it. One thing that I love about any top flight car, BMW 7 Series, Mercedes S-Class, Lexus LS, so on and so forth, is that they are absolutely jam-packed with little ways of trying to make their owners' lives just that bit easier. These are the cars where there are no excuses, as few compromises as possible. And not only is this no exception, it may well be the daddy of quirks and features. Where do we begin? Well, this sits on air ride, not really particularly unusual. But what is, is the interior. You would certainly expect something like this to be all leather. But no, in here, it's wool. This is in fact the most common choice for these cars. There is leather in them, but on surfaces where it's required. So the steering wheel, the center console, and the dash. But everything else is fine, top quality lambs wool. Why? Well, simple. It keeps you cooler in the summer, it keeps you warmer in the winter, and it's quieter. It does not creak, squeak, or rattle. Toyota were in fact so obsessed with noise control in this car that even for something as simple as the little key pouch down here, which can swing around, the genuine item has a magnet, which you can then use to attach it to the steering column so it won't make any undue noises. The floor in the rear of the car is also lower than that at the front, making access easier and more dignified for older passengers. There are also special shoehorns tucked away by each of the front seats, and under the left, a secret storage compartment too. And an old luxury favourite, picnic tables. These ones have a particularly satisfying action. The latches on all of the doors are electrically operated rather than mechanical, just so they're that little bit quieter. The turning circle here is also excellent because this is a car designed for the streets of Tokyo rather than the open roads of Britain, where something like a Rolls-Royce or a Bentley is certainly going to be a sportier experience. That air suspension that I talked about, Toyota haven't even bothered trying to make it a sporting thing. They know it's here for one reason and one reason only, to make your passenger's life in the back that much better. The car has wing mirrors. Yeah, I know, that may not sound particularly unusual, but most cars have door mirrors. These, as they would have been back in the 70s, are on the wings. The reason for that being, apparently, your chauffeur does not have to turn his head quite as much to check blind spots if they're correctly set up, and it also means he can see the kerb just a little bit easier. The car is also, in comparison to a Rolls-Royce, just that little bit narrower, 1890 millimeters wide, where many a modern luxury car is the full two meters. As you might expect though, all of the greatest luxuries are reserved for those in the back. So you have things like a passenger seat here, which can be electronically controlled by those in the rear and also has a little section that opens up so you can stick your legs through. This is much like the Nissan President I drove, also brought to me by this car's kind and very Japanese obsessed owner, Brad. The front seats are heated, but the rear seats are heated, cooled, and also have a rather aggressive massage function that feels like sitting on a dual shock controller. It just goes brrrr. Quite aggressive, actually. Quite nice, though. 
you have a plethora of reading lights too. In fact, I counted some seven in the back, a couple on the side, a little fold down vanity and an adjustable light in the rear too, which I didn't spot earlier, but have now seen in the rear view mirror. The badge on the vehicle, a Phoenix, represents the Imperial House of Japan. The one at the front, I believe, takes over 40 days to hand carve. All of the wood and metal on display are the real deal. These cars are all hand assembled, built only by the most exclusive craftsmen. To work on a century is considered a great honor. The paint on the cars is also hand applied, wet sanded down in a process featuring no fewer than seven different stages. Combining the luxury and Japanese car bit, the car also would not have had tinted windows by default. That is something Brad's put on. Instead, what it has is, well, sliding doilies. Basically, this apparently is the Japanese way to do it. Tinted windows are not really something that high class people like. They do, however, enjoy privacy when it's required. And so sliding curtains were the compromise. The Toyota Century is also such a statement car that it doesn't have to be blingy in the way that something like a modern Rolls Royce or Bentley is for people to know that the person in the back must be someone of note. This is why it rides on merely 16 inch wheels with 225 section wide tires. Originally Bridgestone Reginas, now Falcons, chosen because they were the quietest tire that fit. It is not a sporty thing to drive. The steering is very slow, very light, gloriously simple dash. I will put my foot down for a moment though, just to see what it's about. Yes, it will move, but honestly, it's the cornering bit that's worrying because the car does not feed back to you at all. The suspension is very, very wallowy, as are the sidewalls of the tire. 60 profile, these things. And earlier, it did flash up the traction controller in a scenario where just about nothing should. Even your flimsiest of cars with cords hanging out the tires shouldn't have had a problem there. And this was struggling, so it really isn't about the going fast bit. That is where a Bentley or a Rolls Royce is just that much better. But like I said, this has no interest in going fast because this is designed for people to be ferried around Tokyo and there you cannot go fast. So what's the point in designing a car that'll let you go quick if you can't? Quoted economy figure is about 22 to the gallon. That's a UK number. Around town, Brad tells me you can get an easy 300 miles between fill-ups. Extra urban, you're talking about well over 400. Like in your Rolls Royce though, there is technology here, but naturally a lot of it is obscured. Up front you do have a screen, though it's not really telling me much because I haven't put the correct map disc in it. Below you have your basic AM, FM, cassette, CD changer controls and HVAC. But in the back you also have a DVD player. Earlier models had a VHS in them. That's on a screen that's hidden behind a little nice piece of leather. Not only that, but one of my favorite bits about this car is the fact that for nosy passengers in the back, you can also tilt the headrest of the passenger seat all the way down, giving you a near unobstructed view of what's happening out front. Fold down the little center armrest and you'll find, naturally, your cup holders, your controls for all the seats, including the one in the front here, but also a Century branded Walkman. Yep with special headphones in a very nice little case that Brad has not used. You'll also note that the Walkman has a little charging socket which can be plugged into the car directly and so is a perfect way for your Japanese businessman or woman to be able to enjoy, I don't know, a mixtape from a lover? The rear doors are also the only ones with soft close, though curiously the car does not have double glazing. I don't think it really needs it because this is a wonderful and serene place to be. The glass is on the thick side and to be fair, the wool and everything else does help isolate you from just about anything and everything. Another item missing from the spec sheet, which I think many people would now expect, even in a mid-level Western car, is a self-opening boot. It will unlock itself and also has soft clothes, but if you want to open it, you have to get a man for that. Luckily, everyone with a Toyota Century has one of those. What you will find in the boot though is two rather odd looking rails which don't seem to serve any obvious purpose. What they're for is for your driver to be able to hang his drying towels on, not spoiling anything that you've kept in the back. The boot is also of a very generous size and I'm certainly not implying any sort of criminal connection with the Toyota Century when I say that it's just about big enough for two bodies. It also has, and here I think I may reach my pinnacle of quirks and features in just about any car ever, a duster made with real ostrich feather kept in its own little special 
carpet pouch so that the car can be just gently dusted off while you're waiting for Sir to get out of his meeting. You've also got a flag mount out the front for the proper diplomat VIP effect and at the back an antenna, though what for, we're not sure. So then, what would this slice of the Japanese CEO life cost you? Well, actually, not that much, though an exact figure is quite hard to pin down on account of the fact that these were never really sold in any great numbers outside their home market. I believe they cost the equivalent of about 110 to 115,000 pounds. They were not actually even the most expensive car that Toyota sold. Much like the VW Phaeton, I believe building this was a point of pride. It was important to Toyota that the Japanese elite had a Japanese vehicle to go about their business in. And so, for that reason, if you told me this was a loss-making exercise for them, I would believe you. How much would you pay to buy one now? Well, that's also difficult to say because, um, while well, I checked Auto Trader, Piston Heads, eBay, Facebook Marketplace, Gumtree, and Car and Classic this morning, and there were none for sale. In reality, an older example like this, you might pay as little as sort of £15,000. Getting parts isn't impossible, though they do all require shipping from Japan, and the cost of doing so has grown a lot in the last few months. Even small pieces of trim, little bits of plastic to go in the engine bay cost £100, but then 50 to 100 to get them shipped over. So then, how does this compare with the other claimants to the title of world's finest luxury car? In terms of the things I've driven, I've experienced the Silver Seraph, the Rolls-Royce of this era, also a number of Bentleys, both around the early 2000s and also more recent stuff. And I would have to say, it depends on one real key thing. Which seat are you in? Because if it's this one, then I would say something like a Bentley, particularly an early 2000s one, when VW had taken over, the Continental GT, the Flying Spur, the Molzan, those are the superior experience. Also, if you happen to be a leather fanatic or you like your gadgets and toys, something like an S-Class will also be a much more entertaining and exciting car. A Rolls-Royce, of course, will also do the luxury thing extremely well, and the modern-day Rolls combines, I would say, luxury with sportiness better than just about anything else. Your current generation of Bentleys is, I think, just a little bit too harsh to really enjoy as a luxury item. They're trying too hard to be sporty. If you sat in the back, I think it's pretty fair to say that very, very few other cars are quite so interested in your experience as the Toyota Century. I suppose the other thing, often forgotten by many, is that luxury is also about quality of engineering. This is something where many manufacturers, I think, miss the mark. Yes, the car looks lovely, shiny and nice when it's brand new and is full of toys, tech and features, but what's it like after 100,000 miles? Was it really that well built? In recent years in particular, I think a few manufacturers have cut a few too many corners. Not the case with this, because it still drives, goes, and feels pretty darn good after, are you ready? 406,000 kilometers. That's a quarter of a million miles. That's moon mileage. This car is proper. The Nissan President was a pretty darn good facsimile, but this just has an added air of glamour and sophistication about it. Brad tells me that everywhere he goes, people are waving, shouting, giving him the thumbs up, coming to talk to him about it, both those who know what it is and those who don't. It should probably tell you everything that you need to know that when I told my friends at Toyota UK that I was driving one of these, even they said, wow, that's a special car, and it is. A huge thank you to Brad for bringing it out, and as ever, to you for watching. This is the mad, the weird, the wonderful, and I still think the rather marvellous Toyota Century. Japanese engineering at its finest. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.